Welcome to the Teacher's Toolkit for Literacy, the free podcast for motivated teachers and school leaders who want to inspire their students and school community in literacy learning. Make sure you subscribe to the show on your favourite podcast player, and for more amazing literacy resources, check out the show notes provided with every episode. Hi, I'm Sharon Callan, and I'm the host of the Teacher's Toolkit for Literacy. In every toolkit episode, we bring you specific resources, tools, strategies, tips, techniques to help you in your job as a teacher of literacy. Firstly, we acknowledge and pay our respects to the Ghana people, the traditional custodians whose ancestral lands we gather on. We acknowledge the deep feelings of attachment and relationship of the Ghana people to country, and we respect and value their past, present and ongoing connection to the land and cultural beliefs. Welcome to newcomers listening to the podcast. We love hearing the diverse reasons why teachers are joining us. So much deep and creative literacy work going on in schools. And just to share a few of the recent comments that um, come in when people join the Teachers Toolkit for Literacy because we ask what brings them to us and um, what they would like to... um, um, what they'd like from the podcast. Um, So a few things. Someone has written in, I've made it my goal to improve my toolkit for teaching literacy in schools and I believe this group will help me achieve my goals. And that's from a pre-service teacher. I have to say a lot of pre-service teachers are joining us and love that... um, you know, through the podcast, we can share a lot of uh, collective wisdom that we can bring to young teachers as they are launching into their career. Um, a university teacher educator said, I'm interested in keeping up to date with best practice, research and discussion in the field. And then we've got comments like developing a sense of community in which knowledge and advice can be freely exchanged. And I'm interested in strengthening literacy in the arts and current insight into literacy in general and how to corp- incorporate it into everyday classes. And I think that's a key thing that we try to do through the podcast is how does what we're talking about translate into the everyday, into real classrooms, into real situations. So if you're not a member of the Teachers Toolkit Facebook group, you can join us via Facebook and um, we'd love it if you could introduce yourself to the group. So this podcast, we are welcoming back a favourite, Rebecca Bird, lover, reader, talker of all things books. <laughs> so welcome, Rebecca. Thank you very much for having me again. Oh, we love it, and we always get lots of great feedback oh, that's on good these. To hear. Yes, for my ramblings. <laughs> yes, um, always lots of um, interest in what you've been sharing, and um, lots of times on the Facebook uh, group, people say, "Oh." You know, bring back Rebecca. We need more, <laughs> need more information around um, books that are. Um, well, actually, we'll talk a little bit about that because in schools we don't always have a somebody that we can go to. So, Rebecca, maybe you could talk us a little bit about the. Yes, if we haven't got somebody mm-hmm. to ask in our schools, what's a good way to, for us to open up some doors for what's good in children's literature? I think no matter where you are in Australia, find a bookshop that you are, that's close to you, I guess is ideal, um, but that you feel good about and you sort of can gain a relationship and trust with. Because I think books, all books, I think picture books, novels, you need to sort of have some relationship with that person. So you know you're on the same wavelength. Yes. Um, I do think it's a very personal thing, picture books. I think what one person likes and what another likes is sometimes just down even to the artwork or the feeling it gives you. Um, doesn't even matter what the writing is. It can be amazing writing, but that connection is something that you, you'll either have or you won't. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we – obviously, I'm from Peggy Williams Bookshop and we do sell to everywhere and we're always there to be able to talk to um, – but you would probably have a bookshop wherever you are where there's somebody who's got a passion for children's books that you can absolutely tap into and that they would be more than happy to share what they know, what's coming up, what's been amazing, um, things to look out for. And if you're really lucky, even to sort of tie things in with curriculum and other things like that, it's just that knowledge of... It's not something you can... I say you can't really learn it because you probably can, but... The more you immerse yourself in it, the more you have. And it's from, you know, years ago. There might be an amazing book from 10 years ago that 
you can just, you know, at the drop of a hat, you know, oh, that one will be really good and it will work with this one that's just come out or, or whatever. Um, as far as if there's no bookshop, then I do think social media, I know a lot of people might want to steer away from it because there's a lot of bad things about social media, but I think it's a really good place to bring like-minded people together. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a lot of communities online. So obviously there's um, a Facebook group for this group. Uh, there's lots of library groups on Facebook and lots, and you don't have to be a librarian and you don't, don't worry that people will think, oh, I'm not a librarian so I can't go on there. If it's a good group, they'll be open to anybody who wants to learn. And oh, that's wants, a nice suggestion. Yeah, to take yeah. that experience um, from other people and you'd hope that people are willing to share what they know and encourage other people to learn because everybody's learning and everybody's yeah. coming from somewhere. Yes, yeah. So... There's social media. There's authors. Authors are amazing resources as well. Oh, yes. They, I do but think that they are so generous with what they give. And, again, it's mainly through social media. But, you know, you know what books they've got coming out. You know, they're very big supporters of other authors as well and they're always promoting yeah. each other and talking, you know, each other up. So that's a really good way to keep abreast of what's coming out. Figure out the authors that you like um, because they will lead you to other authors as well. So... I, yeah, I, I think nice it's a one. big I thing. Yeah. You're absolutely right about the generosity of authors in there because a lot of authors have their own websites yes. as well yeah. these days and there'll be readings of books and there'll be all kinds of insights yeah. and information and, as you say, um, you know, recommendations um, yeah. for others as well. So, all right, so there's some good places because, um, you know, and, and people that – that love to read and love to talk about books will always share information. Yeah, about it. Well, like, I that's think, what yeah, we want you, to do. Yeah, you probably have to shut them up at some <laughs> <Yeah>. point. <laughs> um, so, yes, bookshops. And I think in, in many ways, if we have got access to a bookshop, for a lot of us, that's, that's kind of like our school library yeah. now in a sense, that, you know, yeah. there's the place where we've got an expert that we can go to. Mm. And when you've got dedicated children's bookshops or children's book sections, yeah. then you know you're going to be able to get somebody to give you lots of information. Yeah. Um, so today, um, why, why have we brought Rebecca back again? One, because we're always being asked to bring Rebecca back. Um, and, and it's just another great way to really give some insights into some of the new um, – well, you've really chosen – you always choose across a range of um, year levels yes. or age groups. Um, and I think today you've brought some of the – some books that um, are more recent and some that are maybe over the last year. They are all Australian. I'm taking it. Um, maybe, maybe there's not. There's two here that aren't. Um but these are, and I will, I um, just might take the opportunity as well just to talk a little bit about the um, Children's Book Council of, of Australia um, shortlist. Yes, that, yes. I guess perfect. in schools and libraries, that's a really big thing at the moment. So it's worth, um, I guess, just sort of giving, I'm not an expert by any stretch. I'm, I'm not part of the Children's Book Council. Um, but a lot of people, again, who are just coming into libraries, they just, they, you know, have been told, oh, you've got to get the book quick books. And for some people, that's brand new and they don't know what it is and they don't know how to do it and they don't know who's created the list. So every state will have their own branch, but there is a website, um, Children's Book Council of Australia. So it's worth going there and having a look and sort of just seeing what they do. But every year they put out in March, they put out a long list, a notable book list, which is essentially um, the judges' decisions on the best books um, from the previous year. So this year, the 2022 uh, shortlist are all books that were published last year because obviously they've got to have a chance to read them. Yes. <laughs> so throughout <laughs> last year, the judges were very busy and that's what they did. So there are categories for picture books, uh, early childhood, younger readers, older readers, the Eve Powell Award, which is an information book category, and there's also an, a category for new illustrators as well. Um, and then later, so just recently, um, when was it announced? Doesn't really matter. It was in, I think it was the end of March. Just before, yeah. yeah, I think it was the 30th of March. Uh, the shortlist was announced. So from that long list, um, which is usually about 100 books, I think this year it was 
Oh, it was about 121 this year. Right, and they're the ones that make the notable list. So that's list. the notable list. Yep. So that's the big list and that comes out first and it's really good that it comes out first because a lot of people use that as a guide to things they might have missed last year. Yeah. So it's a really good way to go through all of those categories and think, oh, that looks good, that looks good, because somebody else has highlighted it. You can find information on it easily. Mm. Um, and if you don't have it in your library, that's a good chance to get it. And then the shortlist comes out, which is groups of six books. So each of the categories have six of the best books. And from there, they pick one winner. And that is announced on the 19th of August. Um these days, I think with budgets in libraries, what they are, mm. most people can't afford to get everything. I'd say yeah. once upon a time, people would just buy the whole shortlist. Yeah. Um, even if they had copies in their library, they knew that they would be used, um, so they would just buy them. But these days, budgets are much more restrained. So it's more important now to really have a good look at all of the books, yeah. see what suits you and your school, yes. and things that will be used. Because just because it's a good book... If it's not a good book for your school, then you've spent money on something that's not going to be borrowed. Yeah. And as much as it's good to broaden horizons and introduce new things, I think that it's also very important for schools to have books that are really not on their shelves because they're always being borrowed. Yes. You don't yeah. want a book, <laughs> an award-winning book that was borrowed once. Yeah. Um, so the, it's... A good way of having a look. I'd also, when we were talking about going to bookshops, this is a good time as well to talk to whoever is in your bookshop. Um, which books do you think I want? Some of them, I think, in the younger readers category this year. So younger readers category is sort of primary school age. They're all at the top end of the primary school age. So there might be some content in some that you might not want in your school or you think, oh, look, our year sixes this year are not mature enough for that. So perhaps we'll give that one a miss this year. The older readers category is always older, older. Some people think, oh, we've got mature kids in our primary school, that'll be, that'll be fine. But it's not, you know, good readers, it's older content. So just be really aware of that as well. Actually, and oh, sorry. Yeah, no, go. I was just going to say that probably links in with something that as a classroom teacher I would always be, you know, looking to the notable list for really is like what's going to be my read aloud yeah especially for older readers out of this what might be a text that might not actually be the one that would be picked up by students in yes. my class but what's missing from their experience yeah. with texts and so so a teacher coming to that list from the lens of you know what what exposure, you know, from our Australian curriculum, what range yeah. of texts we are bringing to our students and what might be there that could be um, something that we could bring to our students. Um, so I guess in that way, some teachers thinking about some of those yeah. books and that they want to bring in and not just, a, you know, a not just a librarian, but yeah. someone who's in that book buying um, position in the school. And I think it's worth remembering as well that this is a literary award. Yes. So, yes, some books will be challenging for kids. They're not necessarily going to be easy reads. The whole point of them is that they're there for their literary merit. That's not to say they're not a good story, um, but these are books that might not be have been found by kids just yes. by chance um, because, you know, they're, they're swamped with all the really popular stuff, which is good, but th this is the perfect opportunity to take, especially in the younger readers, like the picture books are really good and the early childhood picture books are really good, but I do think picture books get a really good go. Like mm. kids will borrow, little kids will borrow anything um, and everything <laughs> and they'll either like it or they won't and that's yeah. fine. But novels, I think kids do get very focused on what they like and it takes quite a bit of effort to move them away yeah. and this is a good opportunity to do that. Um, publishers are amazing at also producing uh, teacher's notes that go with these books. Yes. yes. So you can access um, – anybody can access teacher's notes um, from publishers' websites. They're usually – if you look up a book, if, it's, if there is such a thing as teacher's notes for that book, there'll literally be a link on the bottom. Um, on our website, we actually put the link with the book as well that links yes. to the publisher's notes. That's a really good way as well. I think, especially with some of the picture books um, – 
you think, oh, how will I use that? Like, it's a good story, but if I want to use it in the classroom and you can't quite get your head around how the teacher's notes might often, you know, trigger something and go, oh, that, that's right, that's how I can use that. And once you've got that figured out, you can think, well, I can do it for this and this and I can pull this book in and I can do that. I think it's a, a good starting point. And I said that to um, teachers and librarians as well. Like, if you're trying to decide which ones you want, that's a good place to go as well yeah. because you'll Great see... Advice. yeah how it can be used because yes. if you're really worried about money and everybody is nobody has got the budgets that they used to and even teachers we get so many teachers buying their own books yes yes because when you want a book you want it now you don't want it to be in the library when you want it and you don't want it to get lost and books go out of print yeah yes. so if you have a book that you really love um buy a copy keep it safe yes <laughs> don't lend yes. it to anybody um so you know you've always got it when you need it so it's it's a big thing at the moment, the, the shortlist. It is actual book weeks, not until August. And a lot of people th- see that that's so far away and I don't have to worry about it yet. Um, but the books are always hard to find. Mm. So, like I said earlier, the books are published last year, which means that depending on when in that year they were published, a lot will have to be reprinted. These books are the most popular books in the country at the moment. Um, so while part of your brain is probably thinking they should be everywhere, you have to remember that because everybody wants them, that's the reason they're not. Um, they will come in in dribs and drabs. So my advice is to get your order in as quickly as you can if you haven't and then just wait. And they will come, um, but don't wait and think, I'll just get them two weeks before book week. That'll be fine. I don't need to worry about it until then <laughs> because by then you might not get them. Yeah, yeah. So I really like that Thinking back, you know, as early as um, the notable list when yes. that comes out yep. because that is actually a good place, isn't it? To well, and, and all the notable lists are up for every year, aren't they? Yes, you can go so back and look at everything. It's yes. a really good double check or, mm. you know, just a cross-reference to see what you've got and how you're faring. I mean, there are books on the notable list that I think – I don't want to say I think are better. I understand the judging process and I, it's the reason I don't think I could ever do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think it's funny. Lots of people will say, oh, they don't agree with it. They don't. And you, that's sort of the point. That's okay. <laughs> you don't have to agree with it. No. It's somebody's decision and there's good reasons for it. Um, but that's why it is good to look at the notables because I think there's, there are some amazing books that didn't make the shortlist that yes. I think should yeah. absolutely be in every library. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, look at the whole list, mm. I think. Um, and it's actually a nice way as a teacher to feel like you can be somewhat up to date with what's actually even around there, out yeah. there. You know, yeah. to even be able to um, – I mean, I really – I do love a browse on that list because it does mean that you, you get to read that little bit of a synopsis about a book and you go, actually, that's – that piques my interest enough <laughs> – to go have we got that here in the school or if not that could be my read aloud or that could Mm. that's that's something that connects with what we're doing in the classroom um so so it's a good way to um to build up particularly the knowledge in each country that you're in because it's not only australia that has the children's book of the year award no there's that correct well there's other countries that do different awards and through different things so like there's the greenaway i think it's called the clip greenaway medal now um there's the caldecott yes lots of countries have their own and they again that's a really good place to see what other people think are, is is good. Yes. So, yeah. And especially the American, the Coldercott, that's always yes. quite interesting. Um, and I was going to say on the Children's Book Council of Australia website, they've actually got, I looked at today, they've actually got the judges' critiques that you can oh. look at for the shortlist. Yes, yes. So if you are questioning their <laughs> judgment, um, it. It's always, I think, good to read why they chose it mm. um, and that gives a little bit of insight. That's even more than a blurb as well. So I yes. think that that critique is actually very useful um, because you can look at that and go, oh, okay, I can see why that's on there. Oh, I didn't really think about that aspect of that mm. book. Mm. Um, so, I th- And I think also most states will have evenings with the judges so you can listen to them talk about the books and the process and why they were chosen. So, mm. yeah, that whatever state you're in, have a look out for that as well. 
Nice. That, that's passed me by, that one. Did not know that existed. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the judges are also available to go to schools. Ooh. I might be putting Ooh. someone in a whole lot of hot water here, but I do believe that's part of being a judge is that you are available to to do that. Oh, so nice. It's worth looking Ooh. at your local branch and yes. just seeing what they're offering as far as that goes. Yes, Fantastic. All right, because we're always interested in, yes, who we can tap into. Yeah. yeah to come, especially yeah. coming into schools. Yeah. You know, it's just a fresh face and it's can. just another person's point of view, but I think yes. it makes a big difference. Yeah. 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 Terrific. All right. Well, Rebecca, let's go booking. Okay. okay. <laughs> so I do, I always have to have the physical books with me. I'm not very good and I don't know why because I'm not looking at any notes and I'm not looking inside the book but it just helps me if I have the book in my hand. The first one, I'm pretty sure I haven't spoken about this before so let's hope I haven't. It's by Linda Sue Park. Um, it's from America. It's a little hardback novel. It's quite highly illustrated throughout and it's called The One Thing You'd Save. Now, it's the sort of book, this is the, this is the perfect book for a classroom. I'm not convinced that kids will borrow it, <laughs> which isn't a very good recommendation. But no. once it's introduced to them, I think it has the best idea of nearly any book I've ever read. So Linda oh, Sue Park wow. has written this book. It's a verse novel and she's used a particular type of poetry. It's a poetry called um, Sejo, oh. uh, Shizo, um, and it's Cro- Korean poetry. Spelt. It is spelt S I J O. Yes. And she's given me a pronunciation here, which is very helpful. Mm. It. The premise of the book is, the teacher says to her class, and I think they're probably year fives. Let's say, if your house was on fire, and you could save one thing, your family are safe and your pets are safe. What is the one thing you'd save? Oh, great question. Yeah. And it's it's a really interesting look. So each of the sort of poems is from different kids' points of view. So at the start you get, oh, well, money, of course, or the credit cards, that's what you'd get. And then they sort of just throw things out. And then one says, well, I've got this jumper at home that is knitted from wool that my grandmother made for her husband. Mm. And she undid it and knitted me my own jumper. That's what I would save. And once that sort of is out there, all the kids sort of stop and think, oh, okay, (laughs) let's think about this. And they ask all sorts of questions like, is my rock collection one thing? Or, you know, so it's, it's really interesting. And because it's illustrated, there are pencil drawings through the whole thing. So as well as you get the words, you also, through the illustrations, get a little bit of a glimpse into each child's life. So it might be their bedroom. So you can see what they've got on their bookshelves and what they've got on their walls. And it's just, I, it makes me wish I was in a classroom because I think it would be the coolest thing to do. I don't know why I don't have that (laughs) book, Rebecca. So it is, like I said, it's not published in Australia yet. But when I saw it was coming out, we just keep getting it in from the US because um, I, I just think that there's been nothing like it. It's very thin. It's not a long read. It's one of those books that... It's not going to take a long time to read it, but it will stay with you for a long time. Yeah. And I think what you could get out of it in the classroom would be very interesting. Yes, because it it can take it to not just being what I read, but to, to what I – well, the thinking that it prompts for yourself. Yeah. The discussion – you yeah. would have as a class around yes. that. And, so how, and how opinions change, like yes. I said, because they jumped to the gun and then thought, oh, hang on a minute, you know, there's lots of things you can replace. Mm. What can't you? Mm. Mm. Yeah. So what's meaningful? So it's written, um, so it's from the teacher's point of view? Well, the teacher, or? The teacher prompts um, the class and then... It basically each child is talking about what they would keep. Right. Um, And then we see their thoughts change over the course of the book. Yeah. And like I said, you know, you see just the – you can't see at home (laughs) listening. No, but but it's beautiful. It's all all in black and white. All in black and white. So it's it's just pencil illustrations Mm. and, you know, some kids live in, you know, fancy houses, some kids live in apartments. Um, 
Oh. Yeah, it's oh what I what know. a beautiful world to go into. Yeah, right. So Linda Sue, Linda Sue Park, Park. and the book the is called The One Thing You'd Save. Right on my list. We're buying that one. <laughs> I'll skip from that little novel um, to a picture book. This picture book came out at the start of this year by Carrie Galash and illustrated by Hannah Somerville, and it's called Market Day. And the reason that this really, really sort of struck with me. For those of you in South Australia, this is our central market in oh, this book. It is. It's has this coincided with celebrations? I don't on the think. It, I don't no? think it has. So Carrie is a South Australian author, mm. and it's that real. It really. It it's that thing. I, I guess lots of people do it, but going to the market on a Friday night, and that's what this is. So yes. the actual market in the story in the illustrations is very stylized. It's not exactly our market. No. There are certain illustrations where you can see that it is. Oh yes, yes. Um, and this is a family that come from the hills. So it shows in Adelaide when you come from, you go through the tunnel to get into town. So it shows all of that. But as much as it's about our market and it's special to us. Um, It's a book about a family, so a mum and a dad and two daughters that go to the market and she gets a gold coin and she can spend it on whatever she wants. Mm. And it's interesting because it goes through all the different market stalls, all the different kinds of cultures that are there, all the different kinds of food that are there. And again, she can do anything she wants. And I won't tell you what she spends it on, um, but what she does do with her money is just – it's one of those books that just warms your heart and you think, oh, that's lovely. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it, and it's been so popular, I think, because it does strike a chord with a lot of people, you know, inquisitive kids that are willing to try lots of things and, yes. you know, there's things she doesn't like at the market like the octopus and things like that. Um, but it's a really lovely family book and for those in South Australia, you'll pick up on all the little things. So I do like that one. Oh, nice. Nice to – yes. And, and of course, that notion of, you know, for children that grow up going to markets. Yeah, it could be any across market. Across the world, you know, yeah. that idea of going to the market and all of those experiences yeah. of people it's and tastes and smells. And sounds and, and everything. Sounds and, yes. So it would be a very sensory sort of mm. – Book, I'm imagining, and, and, in as, and as much as the text, because it is a market, and because you've got all those stalls, um, there's a lot to talk about within the illustrations, mm-hmm. and I like that as well because sometimes when you're sharing, especially like a one-on-one sharing, it's nice to pick up all the other things that are going on in the story, yes. not yeah. just what we're being told by the author. There's often through the illustrations a lot of other stuff happening, yes. and they look to me. I just saw briefly look like double page spreads, a lot of them. Yes, and with and just full. Yeah. Of things to explore. Yep. Lots of oh, different people, yes. lots yeah. of different – yeah, it, mm. it's really – oh, it's beautiful. Oh, you could talk. That would be – that would be a come back to that again and again yeah. and again book, wouldn't it? And, it, know, and it feels nice for those of you at home <laughs> that can't see it. Once, once you touch it, you'll know what I mean. So that's lovely. Um, another one that literally just arrived this week, I think. Um, this is an English one. This is called Grandma's Story. It is uh, what they would call, guess I call these days is like a narrative non-fiction. Okay. Um, and a picture a, book again. Yeah. So yes. it's picture book format and even uh, like on this year's um, Book of the Year Award in the information book category, we're finding more and more of that picture book non-fiction. Yes. So it's like a double whammy because it's very accessible. It's not your traditional information book that sort of has a contents page and you go here to get this and here to get that. By reading the story, you get the information. Um, I think the title of this one is a little bit... It doesn't do it justice. It's called Grandma's Story. And like I said, it's Moira Butterfield. But what it is, it's about any older person in a young person's life and how all old people yes. were young once. Yeah. And they all have had lives and they've all got lots of stories to tell. So it is basically about that and it's even got prompts on for kids like things to ask uh, the older people. It doesn't have to be a grandparent. It could be your old next-door neighbour. It could be anybody. Um, but, you know, it says you could ask one of the grown-ups that you know a question about their life, like where did you live when you were little? Uh, what food did you like when you were small? What food didn't you like? Um, did you have a toy that you liked the best? So it's got all those prompts that are sort of helpful. 
Um, I do think kids are fascinated by older people, or mm. and they don't even have to be that old. Um, but to find out that you were a baby once, that's a real yeah. thing <laughs> with kids. That sometimes will freak them out. Um, but it's a nice one just to encourage kids to get together with older people yes. and tell stories. And it really, I mean, I don't think books are good because they fit the curriculum, but this one really does. Yes. It looks yes. at family stories yeah. and connection and cultures and just being together. So, and I think especially for lots of little ones who haven't had that connection with their grandparents or it's been different yeah. um, because they've been apart and they have to do things in a different way. Um, I think I think COVID might have done some really good... We've got so many people that come into the shop, grandparents, that have been reading to their grandkids over Skype. Yes. Like, you know, books that they loved when they were younger mm. and they, they've got the same time every night that they'll ring and they'll do that so they'll either do it on zoom or they'll just do it on the phone and they've got this different sort of connection that you might not have because you might not want to have to drive an hour to nana's house but it's easy to ring so it's a different sort of connection so that is grandma's story yes which um for every grandparent day that schools have (laughs) I know, it's you know, a winner. Isn't it? You know, like, what, what are we going to do for it? Well, you know, this whole connecting, yeah, getting the, sto- the stories. Collecting the stories. Yeah. And and as you say, and, and just stories, because we don't always have a grandparent no. that comes for those things, but, you know, the, the older person that we know, yeah. oh, the wealth of yes. information that comes from, yes, that long life lived. Yeah. Uh, Right, what have we got oh, now? So this is another one. It's literally, again, just arrived today. It's We Are Australians by Duncan Smith and Nicole Godwin and illustrated by Jandamara Cad. It's one of those books that is so simple but has a massive impact. So on the back of the book, it literally says, what does it mean to be a citizen of Australia? Mm. I won't read the whole thing but, you know... It just covers so many things. We are Australians. We are citizens of our family, classroom, school, community, church, team, street, suburb, town, state, country and world. We have responsibilities. I'm jumping through here. But I like this bit here that says, First Nations culture and knowledge live through song lines and are shared through dance, story and celebration. Other citizens have travelled to make Australia their home. They have brought their own traditions and celebrations. Australia is unique and so is what each of us brings to it. It is up to us to be part of the present and to act for the future, to know our history, to connect with the people who have lived here for thousands of generations, to acknowledge on whose land we walk. So, And there's more, but it's just beautiful language, mm. simple text, you could read it to very young children and they would just, I think, be drawn to the language. And the illustrations are oh, just... vibrant, aren't they? So, so beautiful. Very, very gorgeous oh. illustrations. You could use it with much older kids looking yes. at citizenship because that's a big yeah. question. What yeah. is it? Um, so, yeah, I think that one is going to be... And the cover is very striking as well. Yes, uh, draw, yes. It, you couldn't not open that book. No, so... <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's a brand new so you have right. to look out we for that one. We are Australians. We are Australians. Lovely. Um, this is a secondary school title. Um, it's Magabala. It's an Indigenous um, publisher. It's called Tracks of the Missing. Uh, I just finished it and it's one of those books. It's definitely for secondary. You're going to have some um, – there's some bad language in there. There's some references to, to drinking and stuff like that and um, – it's about a boy, uh, it's set in Western Australia, sort of up north, and he's an Indigenous boy who lives uh, like out in community but he's come into town because of footy um, because that's the one thing he thinks will sort of give him an opportunity. Um, and that's where this, this book is sort of, it starts out as one thing and turns into something else because an old man has died um, who was a supplier of... They call it sly grog to mm. Indigenous people because they've got restrictions in, you know, these towns and for, you know, responsible service of alcohol. Um, and so he'd been selling and he was found dead in a dam, drowned. And then you have a school bus of the Year 12s that have gone on camp that's missing. 
and they start to worry that these two things are linked. So it becomes a real mystery. Mm. So this boy and his grandfather go with the local policeman to track because the grandfather's a tracker, so they've got to go and um, track. So it's a real. there's quite a bit of tension. Um, he also feels responsible. He did something that he thinks might have affected what happened to the bus. He doesn't want anybody to know. Um, within the story, so you've got a real mystery, and then uh, somebody said once, you should never say that there's a twist in a book because that sort of spoils it. But <laughs> there, it, the ending was absolutely not what I expected, and I really like when a book can do that for me because I think I know everything and I think <laughs> I know how everything's going to turn out. So when it surprises me, that's the sort of book that really stays with me because I think, oh, that's clever, you did that, and I didn't see that. Mm. Um, but within his story, it's not teaching us about culture but it is giving us an insight into what it is like um, how he and other Aboriginal people are treated by people in the town by teachers um, by law enforcement Um, it talks about the respect they have for each other and for their laws and for culture it's yeah I really really liked it Mm. Um, I don't like to say it's a good book for boys um, I don't really like to put genders on books, but if you are looking for sort of a reluctant boy a book um, in secondary school, I think it's got enough. Actually, I've got probably three of those. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think the beauty of those is like, uh, again, I don't really like to say girls will read anything, but girls are much more likely to read about boys than the other way around. Mm. So that's, I guess, the beauty of that. But this is... Yeah, Tracks of the Missing. Oh, I didn't say so, who wrote author? it. Carl Merrison and – I'm sorry if I pronounce your name wrong – Hakia Hustler. Uh, they wrote a book together that was shortlisted a few years ago called Black Cockatoo, oh, which yes. was a tiny little – again, that was quite deceiving because you think, oh, it's, it was in the older readers category, I think, yeah. um, because it was quite a substantial read but very thin read – and I quite like it when a book does that, when it's not difficult to read, but it has a massive impact. Mm, mm. Um, just quickly, uh, a book called Seven Days by Fleur Ferris. Now, Fleur Ferris is an Australian author who has written a lot for older secondary, I would say, sort of middle to older secondary. But this new one called Seven Days is, I think it would be fine for upper primary and early secondary. A boy called Ben who is feeling he's not feeling the love let's say his mum has just remarried and she's on her honeymoon he's supposed to be staying with his dad um but his dad is very business focused and when he gets excuse me an opportunity to go overseas uh, for some business work um he dumps the son with aunt and uncle and cousin and leaves him and he doesn't want to be there. So Ben's just counting down. So it's seven days. That's why the book is called that. Right. While he's there, he d- he's not very adventurous, Ben. He doesn't really like the outside. He doesn't really like doing anything dangerous. Um, and his cousin's all about dirt bikes and climbing and, you know, he doesn't really like animals and this family um, have rescue animals. They've got a kangaroo <laughs> that always wants to attack him. They've got a goose that always <laughs> attacks him. Um, they always do. <laughs> oh, but, and then he finds out that... His family and another family in town have this feud. They hate each other because of something that happened years and years and years ago. And when he finds his great-great-great-grandfather's diary, he thinks that there might be something in it. And um, it was all about these stolen jewels. Oh, wow. This, so, is, this is getting really so, interesting. And he, he gets a map and everything and he finds out where it is. And so in the middle of the night, they've, he's got to sort of let go of all his fears... And he's got to do all of the things that make him uncomfortable because he wants to put everything right. Mm. Um, there's a lot of action. There's some humour. Um, yeah, and again, I don't want to say, but I didn't really. It was quite clever. You sort of you think you know how everything's going to pan out and then it doesn't really work out like that. Um, so, yeah, again, it's just a, it's an easy read. It's a fast-paced read. That's what she's famous for. Everything yes. she's done yeah. is – and I think – if you have reluctant readers, it needs to just keep going yeah. and going and going. So you can't put it down because you need to know what's going to happen next. And that's what she does so well. That's it. And that's, you know, that's, I think, what can turn reluctant readers is if there's something that really propels them into yes. it to go, oh, I, I, 
I can't stop now. Yes. I don't want to stop now. Yeah. That's a turning point, isn't it? Yeah. So, all right, so Fleur, Fleur Ferris. And I'll just give you a sneak. This book is not out yet. Ooh. Um, oh, we like one of those. Thank you. But it will be very popular. It's Tristan Banks. So Tristan Banks, um, he kind of writes two types of stories. He has written uh, Two Wolves, The Fall and Detention uh, before this, which is sort of aimed at that upper primary, early secondary, which uh, sort of tackles serious, not too serious, but thought-provoking topics um, for that sort of age group. Then he has a series um, about a character called Tom Weekly, which are much younger, very, very funny. Um, so he's very clever. He's really got everyone covered. <laughs> so this one is so called... This one sit. This one is the older. Right. So it's not funny. I mean, it has got humorous elements in it, but it's definitely of the more serious note. Um, it's called Cop and Robber. It reminds me, I guess, a lot of the Two Wolves story because I think just because it's the father and son. So without spoiling it too much, the <laughs> book starts off at a petrol station... And the boy's in the car uh, and he's looking into the service station where he sees his dad and his dad is robbing the service station. And he's just mortified because his dad promised he would not do this anymore. And to make matters worse, he sees his school principal pull up in the car next to him. So he sort of slinks down in the seat and as his dad's trying to get out of the police station, uh, out of the service station, he knocks over something and everything goes crazy and then his dad gets in the car and they're off and there's a chase. And they also happen to be driving with pumpkins in the back, um, which he thought they were picking up legitimately, but no, they weren't. (laughs) Pumpkins. Pumpkins, stealing pumpkins. (laughs) So that's a cross-country drive to sort of get home and they get there so... Dad and he are in the car and he's like really angry at his dad. You know, you said you wouldn't do this anymore. And he's, he's like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So they're there in the house and there's a knock on the door. Open the door. It's the police. It's also the boy's mum. So the parents have split off. <laughs> <laughs> so that's oh, the premise is... of cop and robber. robber. So the dad is the robber with a good heart. Like, he's, mm. you know... You don't want to say criminals are good, but, you know, he he really feels like he just wants that break. He just needs that break. And you've got the mum who loves her son and respects, in a way, the father. Um, But it's not – it's her job to uphold the law. Uh, And then the dad sort of wants to involve the boy in something, the one thing that's going to sort of change him and that'll be it. After that will be it. And But, yeah, I definitely won't tell you any more about that one, but – Oh, no, um, no, no, because we all want to read that one now. Yeah. I want to get so that one. Into that, that one is out in July, so you still have a little bit of a wait. But oh, right, okay. Yeah. So we we yeah, can sorry. we can pre order probably. Oh, oh um, any Would bookshop it? you'll be able to pre order. Yes, yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We we see books um, three months ahead. So at the moment we're looking at titles coming out in August. Yes. So most bookshops will have that sort of information to hand. Um, if you know a book's coming out later. I mean, even certain things that are popular like the new Jessica Townsend, um, that we haven't actually been shown that but there is already a publication date I think of September for that. Yes. So very popular things will often have a date so bookshops can put it in their database because yeah. they're the sort of things people are going to want to order. Yes, yeah. All right, so Cop and Robber, Tristan Banks. Yes. I'll be pre-ordering. Okay. <laughs> Because you need to know what happened. Oh, I absolutely do. Just love that. Um, feels like the twist begins the story. Oh, it does. It's yeah. A, it, yeah. It's just that knock on the door and hi, mum or whatever. It was like ah. Oh. <laughs> so you just know you're going to be in for a good ride from there. Yeah. Fantastic. So all of the books will be listed um, on the show notes and um, links to those so that um, people can follow up on any of those and. Um, as always, Rebecca, lovely range of, you know, for our primary and our secondary um, teachers, parents, mm-hmm. those that are listening in, um, so that there's plenty to choose from from there. And like a good book club always does, it yes. just gives us that little taste of something yeah. to say, yes, that's something that I definitely want to follow up on. Thanks so much, Rebecca. It's always wonderful to have your um, insights and energy. Well, thank you very much. I'm always happy to talk about books. (laughs) Yes. So, everyone, listen. Yes. If you haven't um, listened to previous 
podcasts um, that Rebecca has done. You'll get lots of – there's always good um, recommendations in those. And thanks again for bringing us a broad range and us all thinking, right, we've got to get our budget ready, our personal budget for the books that we want to bring. And it's time. I think that all the time – I, if I stop and think about all the books I'll never read, yeah, <laughs> it's yes. quite depressing. So you have to really pick and choose, I think. Uh, Nancy Pearl. Have yeah. you heard of – do you know Nancy Pearl, the don't, librarian, don't American librarian? She's got this great quote and yeah. maybe I'll just yeah, sort of wrap up with um, – she talks about um, when is it appropriate to abandon a book? And she really talks about that, that children should give certainly – um, you know, upper primary and secondary students should give a book 50 pages before they abandon it because really how can an author do everything, you know, in the first couple of pages to get you into the book? Well, maybe Tristan Banks has done <laughs> it right there. But she says 50 pages, give it 50 pages. But she said once you hit the age of 50 – you're allowed to start subtracting your age from 100 and read that many pages because you've got less years left and so you just haven't got time to put so much so much time into the books that you want to get through. So, yes, having the insights is nice to know that we can invest, whether a book's going to be worth investing our time in too. Yeah, yeah to go and follow up and chase up. So thanks again, Rebecca. And um, enjoy the follow-up reading that you do as a listener. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the podcast. To make sure you don't miss any literacy learning tips and insights, please subscribe to our show on your favourite podcast player. At Q Learning, our literacy specialists draw on over 30 years of teaching and international consulting experience to deliver world-class learning solutions. We equip, empower and support teachers to become their authentic selves. To find out about upcoming webinars and about how Q can help you and your school, visit qlearning.com.au. And you can get even more amazing teaching resources right now at teachific.com.au. Stay tuned.